Previously on Airway Cops. Did you even have a plan B? No. But... That's what this is for. Damn it, Mac! Do you know how much your little spree just cost the city? I've been on the phone with the mayor for over an hour trying to convince him that you two were actually doing your jobs out there. Chief, you want my badge? Here's my badge. You want my laryngoscope? Here's my laryngoscope. What I want is for you to stop looking around this death wish that you got and start acting like a good airway cop just for once. Mac, get your ass back in here. I'm not finished with you yet. Francis, get out there and try to talk some sense into him. Maybe he is a lunatic airway cop. But he's the lunatic airway cop this city needs. And it's not Francis. It's Miller. Now remember in airway management, especially advanced airway management, we're, we're talking about passing endotracheal tubes and LMAs and King Airways, have a plan B. If the match blade isn't working, you have a Miller blade standing by. If that isn't working, pull out your King Airway, but have a backup, have a plan B. After years of tireless research and billions of dollars spent in research and development on new advanced airway techniques, science has finally produced a plastic stick. Yeah. Now, it's a great stick. It's a plastic stick. It's called a bougie, and it's a wonderful instrument. Now, the bougie is one of your plan Bs. A bougie tube, when they're asking for it, it looks like this, comes in a long package. But what this is designed for is when you're intubating and you don't have a great view of the vocal cords, but you got a partial view of the vocal cords, well, you can insert this bougie tube in and get that in that airway, in that little tiny opening through the vocal cords. And then I can feed the endotracheal tube over the top and pass that into the airway. Now, I would have loved to have been there when they were designing this one. Figure like six or seven scientist doctors down in some guy's basement trying to figure out this, and they're going, ah, how am I gonna get that big tube in a little airway? It's never gonna go. Bob, it's just not gonna work. Maybe we should go in through the ear. I don't know. Ted, answer the door. It's the pizza guy. And the pizza guy's watching all this, and finally the pizza guy's like, you know, dude, you could probably just put like a little tube in there and then pass the other tube over the top of it. Wouldn't that work? Get out of here, pizza guy. Get, you, we're doctors. We're big scientists, guys. Get out of here. Go. You, deliver your pizzas. Get out of here. Get. Is he gone? Quick, write that down. What did he say? Put the little tube over the big tube. Now, the bougie tube is designed to be long enough that you can get it in the airway um, and manage the endotracheal tube into the airway, but not so short that it actually gets sucked down into the airway, which would be a horrible thing. Oh, mother of Jefferson Davis. I just lost my bougie tube. So a bougie tube is really something you have to have pretty much ready to go all the time. In fact, you should probably just keep one in your pocket. Wait a minute, they beat you to it. Recently at a conference, I saw they actually make a pocket bougie. Seriously, man, what's next? Sir, is there something wrong with your stomach? No, I'm fine.
Another great plan B option when you just can't get the patient intubated. You're trying, there's fluid in the back of the airway, blood, vomit, schmutz, whatever, you can't get them intubated. Another plan B option is a supraglottic airway. And all supraglottic means is, is that the air is being administered to the patient above the glottic opening, so they're not intubated. One of the most popular supraglottic airways on the market today is the King Airway. Now, the King Airway comes in a package just like an endotracheal tube, and it has two cuffs on it. One cuff is going to go into the esophagus, and the other cuff is going to inflate in the oral airway. When placing the King Airway, you insert the device blindly, lift up the tongue, and you're going to place it into the esophagus. You're gonna go ahead and uh, put your air in through the pilot tube, and this will inflate the distal cuff, which is going to occlude the esophagus. It'll also inflate the proximal cuff, which occludes the oral airway. And when we ventilate, pass air through here, the air goes out these fenestrations, and the only place less it left it has to go is into the trachea, because we've blocked off the esophagus, we've blocked off the way out, the air can only go into the trachea. This is a wonderful device. Seen it used with great success many times. Time for the headlines of the latest news of the day. How many times have you heard after the intubation someone complaining that the cords were very anterior? It was a difficult tube, the cords were very anterior. Help your brother or your sister out. If someone's wrestling with an intubation, help them especially if the cords are anterior, and we can do that through external laryngeal manipulation. So you see somebody wrestling with the tube, go, hey, I'm gonna give you a hand. You reach over, you grab the thyroid, and pinch the thyroid. Don't do it this way or put your hands on it. Actually grab it and pinch it. You're gonna move it downward and upward and help move those cords more posterior, more into view for the person passing the endotracheal tube. How it'll usually play out is they'll be intubating, and you go, hey, I'm gonna help you a little bit. You provide them a little crank pressure downward and upward, and they go, oh, got them right there. You just move the cords into view, hand me the tube, I can put the tube in. Fantastic. Don't let someone wrestle with an intubation. Give them a hand. Now, if you've been doing advanced airway management in the back of an ambulance or in an emergency room uh, for longer than, say, 10 minutes, you've probably encountered the difficulties of intubating the obese patient. You can't watch TV today without seeing something related to obesity in America. Either a diet pill, a diet plan, some piece of exercise equipment, because Americans are becoming obese. And they pose a particular problem for airway management. So now we have this delightful little device called the Bell Laryngoscope, and a patented procedure for addressing intubating the obese patient. And here's how it works. First, you're gonna instrument the airway with your right hand. Yes, the laryngoscope goes in your right hand. The first time you picked up a laryngoscope was probably with your right hand if you're right-handed. It's your dominant hand, hopefully a little stronger, a little more dexterity. So we're gonna put the laryngoscope in your dominant hand. I know what you're thinking. Let me be the first to throw one out there. So, how many Pollocks does it take to invent a right-handed laryngoscope? One. That was a lot funnier before. What happened? Tell me, what happened? It went dead. I don't know what happened, it just happened. I was standing right over there when it happened. It went there. So I'm gonna instrument the airway with my right hand. I'm gonna reach around with my left hand so I can move the cords into view. Now, they're hard to intubate. I'm lifting a lot of habitus. We've all seen that where the hand's shaking. So the second rescuer is gonna reach up, grab that plate and give me some help. Fantastic. Now I can focus on just keeping those cords in view and pass my endotracheal tube. Bell around his cup. When you're looking at intubating the obese patient, have a plan B. If the Mac isn't working, go to a Miller. If the Miller isn't working, pull out a King, but have a backup. Have a plan B for managing that obese airway. I'm Mark for ACLS Certification Institute, and I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on advanced airway management. Be safe.
as air goes through it passes through these fenestrations and the only place left uh, the only place left this is a rough one so leave it to a Pollock to invent a right-handed laryngoscope <laughs> yeah putts <laughs>